Here we are, Michigan Outdoors in the North Country, our first broadcast from WCMU in Mount Pleasant. Our Michigan Outdoors cabin has a new look. We're still finishing it up at our museum in Houghton Lake. We'll have the cabin there. But we have a show lined up with bluegill fishing. Wally Tabor, his last appearance here in Michigan, a dynamite recipe for bluegill dip. Bob Garner's headlines commentary, a lot more. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. It takes concentration ice fishing for bluegills, but sometimes Lady Luck isn't smiling on you no matter how hard you try. Come on, fish. Hit it. Just, just, take, just keep it rolling here. It's going to go. Okay, now I pull my special technique. And that's <laughs> starting to lift it. Nothing home? <laughs> Nothing home through my hole in the ice. Now, a flag popped on Lenny's tip-up, so he goes to check to see if anything's home there. We're fishing on a western Michigan inland lake near Muskegon. Lots of houses around it, but good for fishing. Of course, some days are better than others. Nothing on the tip-up, but at last, I have a bite. One is one. Ah, no. Right at the, right at the boat. <laughs> Cut off at the boat. Well, the little one that got away. Maybe I need to freshen my bait. For a bluegill, you use a little teardrop lure. On the hook, add a waxworm or a grub of some type. Now, it looks small, but in the winter, bluegills aren't game for big meals. In that cold water, they just want to nibble on a little morsel now and then. And a little bait on a little hook is all you need. Hand over hand, thread the line down through the hole. Now, when I say thread the line, I should probably say thread the thread. With a little hook on a little lure, you can only use line that's very fine. Two pound test is the standard. Now I know some winter bluegill fishermen who buy monofilament thread and use that. Now why isn't my bobber moving? Eh, maybe I'm not in the right position. Yeah, this one doesn't work out much better either. Now, twitch the bobber a little bit. Give it some action and let it sit. That's classic bluegill fishing technique. Hmm, nothing. Maybe I should bend over a little closer. Give it a little more action. Maybe that's it. Now, I know there are plenty of bluegill down there. Oh, that was a good one. Was it? A monster. Found him, huh? Yeah, boy, I took that bobber right down. Tell us. You can say, Fred, this is fishing like it is. This is fishing like it is. <laughs> fishing like it is, all right. I see other people catching fish all around me. Now, this kid has been cleaning up bluegill after bluegill, and he's only a few feet away from me. Now, the fish aren't running large today, but that's the thing about winter panfish. You work so hard for them, and they're so tasty. You don't mind filleting up a few small ones. In fact, you don't mind asking boys like this if they'd mind if you shared their fishing hole. In return for a little TV coverage, of course. Eh, they don't mind. They think it's probably kind of funny that these older folks can't seem to get a bite, or at least land anything. So they give me the prime location, right between them. Now you'd think this would be the best. Lower my bait right down, watch that bobber disappear, start hauling in these fish along with these two boys. Okay. Now we'll get serious. What happened? I mean, when I sat down, nobody got any fish. I yeah. watched them catch them where I was fishing before. Yeah, look at it. Uh, nice one. That's nice. OK, so put yourself in my boots. What would you do if you weren't catching anything and the other guys were? Well, nice that they don't mind that I move in next to them. But when I do, now I know this is hard to believe, but Mark Martin, who I was fishing with now, stopped catching fish. Just a short distance over, there was Lenny. He said I never should have left. He's catching lots of gills, some of them pretty good size. Well, I'm going to settle down. This constant moving hasn't been working. But next to Lenny, Bob Garner hauls one up. Nah, I'm not leaving yet. Even if Lenny does catch another one? But see, that one wasn't even a keeper. There's your oh, that's got a nice one, So, what would you do if you were in my boots? Move again? Huh, you're darn right. <laughs> you can't catch them where they're not biting. 
If you'll notice, though, I'm not the only ice fisherman with ants in his pants. Mick Furbish wields a mean fishing rod and brings another bluegill onto the ice. Meanwhile, I sit tight, content that I've tried everybody else's spots. My turn has got to be coming. Here we go. Here we go. Look at, look at the technique. Hey, what a monster! Okay, this is ice fishing at its best. Just the way it is, right, Fred? Yeah, we must, definitely must increase the size. These At bite. long last success, but this gill is a bit too small, so back it goes. Bluegills vary in size, so maybe my next one will be a keeper. Oh, God dang it. Oh, it's a good one, it's a good one. It's a good, good one. fish, good fish. Oh, nice one. Nice. Oh, Get him. Oh, oh, that oh. one too. How about that? Too. That's what I've been waiting for all this time. That's the prize of ice fishing for bluegills. They don't battle all that much in winter, but the challenge of ice fishing isn't in the battle. It's in hooking the fish when they bite so lightly. It's in landing them, keeping the line tight, and gently pulling them through the hole in the ice. Now, my pile of fish is just beginning, but here's what ice fishing is really all about the beauty of being outdoors when Mother Nature paints everything cold. When the sun shines, it seems that much warmer. Now there's a challenge in sitting out on a frozen lake and catching enough fish for a dinner. Ah, the battles aren't spectacular, and the anglers are often quiet, but something about it is fun. One fish at a time, they add up. A pike on the tip up, a good mess of bluegills glimmering in the sunset. So you don't think you'd like ice fishing? Too cold? <laughs> We're not. We're enjoying each other's company, and the solitude of ice fishing makes it one of winter's pleasures in Michigan outdoors. <laughs> It's hard to beat fried bluegill or, or fried panfish that you get ice fishing, but Clay Hooker from Manton sent us a recipe for bluegill dip. Sounds like a gimmick, but Kathy Beitler, oh, the way you've very prepared easy. this. I'm going to use walleye instead of the bluegill here, and just any kind of good white fillet will do. And you want to boil those first, and then, and it doesn't take very long, but you do want to boil them completely. Now, some people are going to say this is a waste. Oh, no, to take, it's not. To take a bluegill and, or a walleye isn't. and do anything other than fry it. Oh, you might get all the bones out here. And then you're going to add your cream cheese. And it calls for one eight-ounce package. You're going to mm -hmm. add the whole thing. And it called for four to six olives. And we're going to go ahead and use the chopped. Well, that little pimento gives it some oh, color. Oh, definitely. And a little bit of taste here. And the only spices in here whatsoever are hmm. paprika and a little bit of oregano. There's no saltiness whatsoever, paprika, so you talk course. about heart healthy. Well, that's a paprika, a traditional type of spice that you'd put on broiled that's walleye right. or any, broiled bluegill. Any bell. fish, that's right. And your oregano, just a quarter teaspoon of that. Then you can go ahead and add your chopped fish. That's it. Mix it up Mix and it that's all up. the you easy... You can shape it into a ball or shape it into a fish, whatever you want to do. I wonder what, what Bob Garner would prefer to shape this into. <laughs> Well, I really, it's in a fine shape the way it is. <laughs> Except, Except when the plate gets bare, it'll even be better. <laughs> yeah. Fred, this has a really, not, not strong, it's a strong hint of Italian flavor. It's not a strong recipe by any, man, by any stretch of the imagination. Really good. It tastes like an antipasto, almost. But is it something that, that you, you should use bluegill or walleye for? Oh, right. no. Yes, yes. You're not, you're not ruining it. It's, this is tasty. It's light, and it's, it's very, very nice. Also, you might use it in a salad, you mm -hmm. know, like you well, would chicken would salad good. or whatever. Yeah, that would be good as a salad. Definitely, on a sandwich Excellent. even. You know, it looks like, especially with the red in there, like the, the seafood dip you can get at the store. Mm -hmm. Oh, this beats it. <laughs> it beats it? Oh, yeah. This tastes better than shrimp. It tastes better than lobster or crab. I kid you not. It, it is won't really keep good. two or three days in the refrigerator, too. That's sweet Not my flavor. refrigerator at <laughs> <laughs> Not Bob's refrigerator. This is an easy bluegill dip in our Outdoor Digest. Address coming up at the end of the program. But Clay Hooker from Manton, this is an absolute winner. Thank you.
Stanley Sherman of Hillsdale writes and uh, says, when I visited the fish taking weir on the Little Manistee River, I asked a person there if I could have a couple of salmon to smoke. I was told that the fish were contracted out and I would have to buy them from a contractor. When did the DNR start letting contractors sell our fish and where does the money go? Well, since 1970, all of the fish taking weirs have been operated by a private contractor who bids for the rights to the salmon that the DNR might otherwise have to dispose of. In return, the contractor provides the labor to man the weirs, keeps the weirs maintained, pays a price per pound to the Fish and Game Fund, and saves the department an estimated third of a million dollars. Let's open the pages of the trophy book to crappies, where we find this 13-incher caught by young Allison Bedford from Saginaw. She was jigging a minnow at noontime on October 15th on the Titabawassee River when this trophy grabbed her bait. It's at the taxidermist now. I've always said you can catch big bass during hunting season, and Dave Keevy from Ann Arbor proved me right with this six-pounder he took on November 7th. He was fishing a farm pond with a spinner bait in the middle of the day. 22 and a half inch bucket mouth, suitable for mounting. Alger Kazakevich from Madison Heights ventured out late one night with Mark Martin on Muskegon Lake. Trolling a rapella put him in the book with a walleye that weighed nine pounds, five ounces, 29 and a half inches long. Now look at the first buck taken by 15 year old Dennis Hansen from Fenton. Hunting with his grandpa in the UP's Iron County, Dennis's first buck weighed over 200 pounds, 14 antler points. The longest tine was 11 and 5 eighths inches. What a way to start a lifetime of deer hunting. Trophy like that, what a thrill. Now this is a nice 10 point buck you might call a last minute buck. The season was nearly closed. Now we have Terry Piper from Schoolcraft. Hunting Cass County. This is the last day of the gun season. Last day. How come you took so long? I don't know. <laughs> I just waited, and uh, I guess a lot of it was luck. Were you waiting for a big deer? Did you pass any up during the season? Uh, no, I didn't. I saw a lot of deer, but uh, I wanted a buck, and uh, just so happened that the last 10, 15 minutes of gun season, he showed up. 5 o'clock p.m. You couldn't have waited any longer than that. Congratulations on that, dear. Terry Piper took that as the hour was closing on gun season. Obviously a very patient hunter. Let's make Terry Piper from Schoolcraft our Michigan Outdoors big buck hunter. No, last minute buck hunter of the week. And in the future, you'll see Hank Williams Jr. encouraging the use of steel shot in public service announcements like this one called Get the Let Out. If you're a duck hunter like me, you know there aren't as many birds as there used to be. That's why lead poisoning is such a problem. Estimates are more than two million waterfowl die each year from lead poisoning, which happens when the birds swallow lead shotgun pellets while feeding. We can stop lead poisoning by switching to steel shot. I love duck hunting, and if by just changing the steel shot, I can help ensure more ducks for the future, then I'll do it. Join me in getting the lead out. As winter arrives and the Arctic winds blow, ice fishermen, believe it or not, are now on the hot seat, at least with one state representative. It's Representative Tim Wahlberg of Tipton who has introduced a bill to ban all ice fishing on any lake within 75 feet of the shore. Now apparently Representative Wahlberg has hacked at some ice fishermen who sputted a hole too close to shore where his kids skate. And while there's little doubt that some ice fishermen should be a little more courteous, Wahlberg's remedy is like killing flies with dynamite. Now instead of getting overly upset with this preposterous bill, I'm just going to be grateful this ice fishing season that there are plenty of legislators who understand hunting and fishing and will make sure this attack on ice fishermen gets the legislative royal flush. Want to stay warm outdoors? Well, keep busy. Run over and check that ice fishing rod. Besides keeping busy, well, you have to eat right and wear warm clothes. See, we're warm-blooded. Fish aren't. A fish's body is the same temperature as the water it's in, which could be 36 or even 33 degrees, and it won't kill them. But our body temperatures can't tolerate dropping like that. 98.6 is where it's supposed to be, Fahrenheit. 
Now, this fellow's wool outfit is ideal outdoor wear. Felt pack boots are warm and waterproof, but nothing keeps you warm ice fishing like success. Your heart pumps warm blood all over when you're excited. Well, I tell you, it's a, it's a nice one, whatever it is. Fishing success keeps you warm like a jog around the lake. And here's a perch that's worth getting excited about. Oh, look at that. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, wee. Look at that. <laughs> that is outstanding. Woo, wee. That's a great perch, but I'm also warm because I'm keeping my gloves on. Grabbing onto a cold fish could slow down the circulation in my hands, then I'd be miserable. The idea is to conserve our body heat, keep it inside our clothes. You can lose 35% of your body heat by not wearing a hat in cold weather. And it's not always practical to wear gloves. You know, you can't thread an ice fishing line through the guides or get the line untangled like I'm going to spend quite a while doing here in just a minute. But it's not a good idea to set your gloves on the ice like I do. Because if they get wet, you'll be colder than ever. The real culprit when it comes to hypothermia is water, getting wet, and wind. You don't have to be in snow like this to suffer from hypothermia. Most hypothermia deaths, believe it or not, occur in temperatures between 30 and 50 degrees. What happens is, if you get wet or you're not wearing gloves or a hat for an extended period of time, your body doesn't circulate that blood that gets cold, so your fingers or your toes stay cold. If they're frostbitten, well, they freeze, and they must be thawed out gently. But you can develop hypothermia where your whole body loses heat without becoming frostbitten. You'll get numb, you'll shiver, you'll lose your memory. Now, these are signs you should bundle up and get warm quickly because you're losing inner body heat. People with poor circulation, particularly seniors or people who have had strokes, paralysis or amputation are very susceptible to frostbite or hypothermia, but they have to keep their feet and hands and ears and heads covered to protect their health. But you should too. Get those gloves back on when you're done. Stay dry. It's not only more healthy, but you'll be more comfortable. And both are necessary if you're going to enjoy the outdoors forever. Wally Tabor. Doggone, you know, it's with mixed emotions that I greet you this year. You've been on your safari circuit since, what, 1947? 47 when I really started, Fred. Hunting and fishing films around the country that, you, that you've taken from around the world, and your news this year is that this is the last? This is the last tour. It's our 40th annual lecture tour. <coughs> Excuse me, Fred, and we're going to make it the last. That's, uh, that's, that's sad news. Well, Barry. we're starting out here in Michigan, as usual. We're going mm -hmm. to have a long week show here in Michigan, and then we're going to head over into Ohio and Pennsylvania and New York for three months. So Let's take a look at some of the footage that you're going to be showing on this program, your final program, your final live performance program. This was taken in New Zealand? Yeah, we went down New Zealand, Betty and I, last uh, April and May, and the, the animals down there are different. All the mammals are introduced like the psyche deer. They were brought in there years and years ago, and they became so populated, like uh, the red deer here. They ate off the forest. They, they had to kill them off with professional hunters, paid hunters, meat hunters. One of my friends, Rex Forrester, killed 10,000 deer before he was 21 years old. Well, why did they have such a population problem? There's no, there are no predators there, nothing to curtail them. Not a single predator was ever introduced. No mountain lions, no bobcats, no coyotes, nothing. So they, you mean they didn't have animals there before? No, they had animals, just birds and bats, but no mammals. No mammals. What a story. Now you're gonna be, you'll see on the bottom of your screen the names of the towns and the dates, 8 o'clock p.m. is where they are, where you'll be showing this film, in the next, uh, well, the next two would start Friday night mm -hmm. down in Jackson and run right on through till we finish in Saginaw a week from the Saturday night. I'll be darned. And this is the last chance for well, Wally Tabor Live. That's right, Wally Tabor Live. We've been doing it for 40 years, and I think that's about time to hang up our hat and our voice and our films Boy. and uh, take a vacation. I know we're going to be hearing for you, from you. I want to have you back in a couple weeks and find out what your plans are. But the last live program's coming up this uh -huh. next two weeks here in Michigan, Wally, it's been great. The 40 years have been great. And I'll be back with you. You betcha. We'll I'll look forward back. to it. Thank you, Fred. Fun to be with you. 
fly fishermen use two basic types of flies which are fished differently. What are they? The two types of flies commonly used by fly fishermen are wet flies, which are fished below the surface of the water, and dry flies, which are designed to float on top. I hope you enjoyed the show this evening. It's our first production from the North Country here at WCMU in Mount Pleasant. We're preparing the new Michigan Outdoors cabin at our museum in Houghton Lake. And in a few weeks, when the cabin's completed, parts of the show will be taped there each week. Now this weekend, look for us on the ice at Houghton Lake. We're going to be a part of the Tip Up Town festivities. And next week, we'll bring you an on-the-spot report of fishing activity and the big fish caught at Tip Up Town. Roger McCarville will show us some innovations that make ice fishing for handicappers not only possible, but enjoyable. And our recipe, oh, we have authentic field kitchen stew made with venison. A good basic camp stew recipe, perfect for the winter. Now, it's not supposed to be too cold this weekend, but bundle up. Don't let old man winter fool you. You know, he has a way of doing that in Michigan outdoors. <laughs>